Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. On 28 June 2023, Nanograph yeah. released the findings of 15 years of hard work from by a lot of institutions, by thousands of students and faculty and hundreds of institutions right. on the discovery of the very low frequency gravitational waves. Correct. And so you were a part of this team and we're very honored to have you here. We won't thank take you. up a lot of your time, but thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. We would like to start by talking about the significance of this discovery. Mm -hmm. So if you could just explain about the methodologies and techniques used mm -hmm. by Nanograph, mm -hmm. which were different from the ones used by LIGO, which okay. had an announcement on the discovery of gravitation waves in 2016. Correct. Yeah, uh, so uh, let me start uh, by thanking you uh, for giving me this opportunity to record this video. Uh, coming to your question, uh, gravitational waves just like electromagnetic waves are waves, which means that they also have a spectrum and uh, the sources at different parts of the gravitational wave spectrum are different. So the sources that LIGO detected, uh, they usually work in the kilohertz range, which means they were looking at stellar mass black holes or uh, neutron star neutron star mergers. Uh, what the pulsar timing array looks at is nanohertz gravitational waves, which means that their frequency is entirely at a different uh, side of the spectrum, which means the sources are also very different. So the sources for the gravitational wave background that we detected uh, using the pulsar timing array are supermassive black hole binary pairs. So their masses are of the order of few billions of solar masses and they are going around each other in orbits which roughly span of the order of years and that is the reason why their frequencies are in the nanohertz range. So uh, the technique that we used if you now compare it uh, with LIGO because LIGO wants to detect kilohertz waves their arm length is about a few kilometers in size. Because we now want to detect nanohertz gravitational waves, their wavelengths are actually of the order of parsecs or kiloparsecs, which means that you need the arm lengths of the order of uh, kiloparsecs. That is the reason why you need uh, some set of detectors which are present in the galaxy so that you can use uh, the object to earth as the arm, which will be of the order of few kiloparsecs. And pulsars form uh, natural clocks and they are very stable. Uh, so, uh, if the gravitational wave background is indeed passing through uh, the entire cosmos as we thought it would, it would uh, change the distances between these pulsars and earth and even between these pulsars very minutely and that we would be able to catch in the pulses of the pulsars. So, the technique uh, that we typically use uh, for pulsar timing arrays is first of all you have to actually make a timing model for each of the individual pulsars so that you can predict with very high accuracy when the next pulse will be arriving from the pulsar and when due to the gravitational wave signal passing if it changes it usually changes by uh, of the order of a few hundreds of nanoseconds. Uh, so that means you have to be able to predict the arrival of each of those pulses to an accuracy which is of the same order or uh, possibly better. Right. So, uh, sir, could you elaborate on the role of the Indian Pulse Timing Array mm -hmm. and the role that they played in uh, this discovery? And could you also share some personal experience on how you felt when you were uh, working with international collaborators, national and international collaborators? Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the, the discovery was actually made uh, by four different collaborations. Uh, the first is Nanograph, which is in North America. The second uh, is the European Pulsar Timing Array with whom we uh, combined our data from the Indian Pulsar Timing Array. Then uh, there is a Parks uh, Pulsar Timing Array in Australia and there was uh, another paper by the Chinese uh, Pulsar Timing Array at the same time, uh, all declaring uh, the detections. Coming to the Indian Pulsar Timing Array part, uh, as I mentioned before, you actually have to build a very good timing model, which means you should be able to predict when the next pulse arrives. Now that pulse can arrive later or earlier because of multiple reasons, not only the gravitational waves. So uh, as uh, people uh, might be aware, there is plasma everywhere uh, in the galaxy that is called as the interstellar medium. What that interstellar medium does is it actually imposes a frequency dependent refractive index on the radio waves, which basically means that if you have uh, a set of radio frequencies, the highest radio frequency will arrive uh, earlier compared to the lower radio frequencies and the dependence of this uh, refractive index as a function of frequency goes as inverse uh, square of the frequency. So now what that means is if you have 
observations at two different ends uh, of a frequency, then you can actually get a better handle on what are the delays caused by uh, this refractive, uh, sorry, excuse me, this dispersion as we call it. Uh, so, the Indian pulsar timing array has this unique uh, observational capability that allows it to observe at two wavelengths simultaneously, which none of the other observatories are capable of. So, we observe at a frequency range of 300 to 500 megahertz and then 1100 to 1400 megahertz at the same time, which means if these delays change as a function of time, which happens because the structure inside the galaxy keeps on moving, changing, etcetera that allows us to measure uh, these delay changes with a very high accuracy, which in turn can then be provided uh, to the modeling of the pulse arrival times and that helps us get rid of the extra noise that we do not want. Because uh, the gravitational wave background that we are trying to detect is also a kind of noise that we are trying to detect. So, that is where the Indian pulsar timing array was really helpful. And about your personal experience of okay. working with. Right. So, uh, this uh, whole enterprise of pulsar timing arrays actually started uh, in 2002 at other places. Uh, the Indian pulsar timing array, the initial observation started in around 2016 when I was just about uh, uh, to finish uh, my PhD thesis. And uh, that time uh, we were just looking at various instrumental properties which could in principle. Uh, produce a delay in the pulses. There are instrumental delays which need to be properly calibrated and offset before you can actually start using the telescope as a proper pulsar timing array instrument. So, those efforts were just uh, getting into shape when uh, I left. Then uh, during my first postdoc, I was actually working uh, not exactly with Nanograph, but I was uh, an associate member of Nanograph. And there also given uh, the low frequency expertise, I was involved in the noise analysis group which is where a lot of uh, these concepts started becoming very clear because Nanograv has this uh, weekly and monthly meetings where people from all across Nanograv uh, they sit together, uh, it is mostly remote uh, online, but uh, there are a lot of discussions plus uh, they usually have one meeting every 6 months when all of them actually physically come together at uh, one particular institute and then they try to sort out uh, all the you know uh, hurdles that they are facing in data analysis and if there are some interpretations required from different personnel, uh, that is where they actually get it. So, the experience in that sense was really good because I uh, got to go out, travel, meet a lot of people and uh, talking to uh, them and the way they think, it sort of also develops your own uh, perspective of the field. So, that was really helpful. So, after the discovery was released, mm -hmm. the Hellings down spectrum was getting a lot of attention yes. and there were many news articles on the same. Can right. you? Maybe elaborate on this a briefly. Okay. So, uh, it was Hellings and Downs uh, who wrote a paper in 1983, where what they basically did is, uh, let me go back and explain it a bit better. Uh, when I earlier mentioned that you need to be able to predict when the next pulse arrives, that is what is called as the timing model, uh, which takes into account uh, the speed of rotation of the pulsar, the rate at which it slows down. And given that most of the pulsars that we observe in the pulsar timing array are in binaries, you have to also uh, measure the binary uh, parameters with high accuracy. Once you actually make a model of when the pulse arrives and you actually have the data of when the pulse actually arrived, you can subtract these two to form what are called timing residuals. So, what the Hellings and Downs curve does is if you now have timing residuals of pulsars spread across the sky, uh, you basically have to take a pair of pulsars and that will form your arms compared uh, comparing to LIGO. Uh, then you cross correlate their timing residuals and then whatever product you get you make a point uh, on the plot and that plot is basically the correlation as a function of the sky, the angular separation between the two pulsars. So, what Hellings and Downs actually were able to calculate is if the gravitational wave background is indeed passing through. Uh, gravitational waves unlike uh, electromagnetic waves, they have different kinds of polarizations. So, uh, there are there is one polarization which is called as the plus polarization and then there is one polarization which is called as the cross polarization and they are actually at an angle of 45 degrees with respect to each other. The reason behind that is uh, typically the electromagnetic waves occur because of uh, changes in dipole moment of charges 
whereas gravitational waves occur typically because of changes in quadrupole moment of masses, which means that their polarization properties are slightly different. Now, if you take that into account, that actually gives you uh, what we call an antenna pattern on sky, given uh, these peculiar polarizations. What the Hellings and Downs curve basically does is, if you make uh, these pairs of correlations and plot them as a function of angular separation, uh, they were actually able to calculate what the functional form of that should be. And that is why you see that it starts at 0.5, it takes a dip and then it goes back again. And uh, there are various versions of the Hellings and Downs curve, but that uh, depends slightly on the mathematics and how you uh, actually calculate the amplitude of the gravitational wave. So, so when uh, LIGO uh, uh, released their experimental data, the, it almost perfectly matched with their, uh, the theoretical prediction. Correct. Whereas here, uh, the, it, it's not a perfect fit, the theoretical and the experimental right. data. So, why is it so? Is it probably because we need more readings mm. or is it something else? Okay. So, yes, I mean, uh, you're right that uh, this is not what we would call a perfect match. Uh, and the reason for that is if uh, you talk in terms of detection significance, the result that we are seeing right now is somewhere in between 3 to 5 sigma. So, typically for astrophysics, uh, we would not call anything a detection unless it reaches at least 5 sigma. Right now, it is almost there, but not quite, which means that we will obviously need more data, so that the detection significance will improve. Uh, but there is another distinction compared to LIGO, uh, what we are trying to detect is noise. What LIGO was trying to detect was individual sources. So, uh, for example, if there was an individual source which was generating gravitational waves at nanohertz frequencies, we would be able to detect it straight away exactly like uh, LIGO did. But because what we are trying to detect is actually a superposition of many sources together which has formed a background. Uh, that is why it acts as a noise source and that is the reason why we need detection significance. So, the current uh, results uh, are on the verge of a detection and that is why they are not perfectly matching. So, will it take more time and will we, will the theoretical and experimental data match perfectly? Uh, yeah, correct, yeah, I mean uh, we expect that it should match and uh, as I said that these are individual results. Every two to three years, what uh, we do is all of the pulsar timing arrays put their data together to form a larger and more sensitive data set, which, uh, data set which is called as the International Pulsar Timing Array or the IPTA. The IPTA data combination right now is ongoing and uh, the first data combination is supposed to be done by the end of this year. Hopefully, we will be able to get a 5 sigma or uh, above detection in that data set. That is the expectation. Uh, if not, uh, I think maybe a couple of years of more data should actually push it on the other side of the 5 sigma detection significance. So, when we look in the nanogram website, mm -hmm. there is also an article on the anisotropy of gravitational waves. Correct. Can you maybe briefly talk about why isotropy of gravitational waves is a contradiction to our theory? Uh, okay. So, actually uh, if you just assume that this background was generated due to uh, single sources, but uh, too many of them all across the universe. Uh, this was generated way back in time, because the current theory says that the supermassive black hole binary mergers is what caused the galaxies that we see today to form, uh, which means that it is somewhat similar to what the cosmic microwave background was, which was a remnant of the big bang, which means that there was some source which left this radiation and then it was gone and you, you saw whatever was left of the radiation. Uh, similarly, gravitational wave background, although it is not uh, electromagnetic waves, it is gravitational waves, so space time waves, but uh, they were left uh, as a result of multiple sources, which means that if you just use a simple law of averages, after a lot of time has passed, you would expect that uh, they would have uh, sort of thermalized uh, in the thermodynamic uh, sense of talking. And that is the reason why you expect more or less isotropic. If there is an anisotropy, then that would uh, give us some more science like it did for the CMB. So, more of a general question. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see the field of astrophysics grow from now, especially in terms of, you know, gravitational wave research and things like that? Okay. So, uh, because of LIGO and now the pulsar timing arrays, we are actually opening a new window uh, to the universe. 
Early on we had only the electromagnetic waves uh, which we could detect from the sources and we had to determine what their properties were, you do all the physics that you can do. With the gravitational waves there is a completely new window that we have opened on the universe uh, and now we are covering multiple ranges of uh, gravitational waves. So with the PTA we are covering the nanohertz range, with LIGO the kilohertz range is covered uh, and there are space missions uh, which are supposed to go uh, which is called LISA. LISA will actually cover the ranges in between the pulsar timing array and uh, the LIGO uh, because it will have arm lengths of the order of a few uh, astronomical units which is in between kilometers and parsecs. So uh, that is one thing which is going to change and once that becomes operational which should happen around 2035, uh, I think then we will be truly in the era of what we are calling a multi messenger astronomy not just multi frequency and uh, similar to how when we actually started observing in different frequencies we saw something which we had never seen before. We are expecting that uh, once we start seeing the universe in gravitational waves we will hopefully see something uh, or be able to detect something which we did not expect to. So uh, these are going to be exciting times and uh, hopefully we do see some anisotropy like which was seen in the CMB and that leads us somewhere. So over the years of your experience, mm -hmm. do you see the increase in interest among aspiring students and physicists in this gravitational wave research, maybe in ISA Bhopal too? Uh, yes, that is definitely the case and uh, as what happens typically is that if once uh, some big discovery is announced, then suddenly people's eyes turn towards it and then everyone wants to at least uh, know what is happening. So the interest, is, the interest has definitely peaked. And uh, the good thing is that the faculty members of the Indian Pulsar Timing Array are spread across India. I am um, here at ISAR Bhopal, there is uh, there is a faculty member in IIT Hyderabad, there is a faculty member in IIT Roodki, there are people in uh, NCRA in Pune, TIFR in Mumbai, then RRI, uh, IMSC in Chennai. So we are really spread across India and typically uh, we do have a lot of undergraduate students who come do short projects. Uh, and learn about pulsar timing, various aspects of data analysis. Uh, and right now we are a collaboration of about 45 people and that includes a few colleagues from uh, Japan as well. So including all the undergraduate students, PhD students, postdocs and faculty members. We are about 45, 50 people uh, strong collaboration and hopefully uh, it will grow uh, as uh, interest. Uh, given that it is astrophysics, there will always be interest. But specifically gravitational waves uh, now we are hoping and uh, LIGO India is also going to come up pretty soon around 2030. So that also bodes well for the gravitational wave research especially in India. Thank you so much for joining us sir, we hope you had a good time and thank you so much for giving us so many insights on this nanohads. Yeah, yeah the pleasure is all mine, thank you so much. <laughs>